Chapter 9. Notes on the History of the Discovery of the So-Called Ricardian Law of Rent Section 1. The Discovery of the Law of Differential Rent by Anderson Distortion of Anderson's Views by His Plagiarist, Malthus, in the Interests of the Landowners Anderson was a practical farmer. His first work, in which the nature of rent is discussed in passing, appeared in 1777, at a time when, for a large section of the public, Sir James Stewart was still the leading economist, and while everyone's attention was focused on the wealth of nations, which had appeared a year earlier. As against this, the work of the Scottish farmer, which had been occasioned by an immediate practical controversy and which did not ex professo deal with rent but only incidentally elucidated its nature, could not attract any attention. In this work, Anderson only dealt with rent accidentally, not explicitly. This theory of his appears again in the same incidental fashion in one or two of his collected essays, which he himself published in three volumes under the title of Essays Relating to Agricultural and Rural Affairs, published in Edinburgh between 1775 and 1796. Similarly, in his Recreations in Agriculture, Natural History, Arts, etc., published in London between the years of 1799 and 1802. All these writings are directly intended for farmers and agriculturalists. It would have been different if Anderson had had an inkling of the importance of his find and had put it before the public separately as an inquiry into the nature of rent, or if he had had the least bit of talent in trading his own ideas, as his fellow countryman McCulloch did so successfully with other peoples. The reproductions of his theory, which appeared in 1815, were published forthwith as independent theoretical inquiries into the nature of rent, as the very titles of the respective works of West and Malthus show, the title of Malthus's, An Inquiry into the Nature and Progress of Rent, and the title of West's, Essay on the Application of Capital to Land. Furthermore, Malthus used the Andersonian theory of rent to give his population law, for the first time, both an economic and a real natural historical basis, while the nonsense about geometrical and arithmetical progression borrowed from earlier writers was a purely imaginary hypothesis. Mr. Malthus at once improved the matter. Ricardo even made this doctrine of rent, as he himself says in his preface, one of the most important links in the whole system of political economy, and quite apart from the practical aspect, gave it an entirely new theoretical importance. Ricardo evidently did not know Anderson, since, in the preface to his Principles of Political Economy, he treats West and Malthus as the originators. Judging by the original manner in which he presents the law, West was possibly as little acquainted with Anderson as Tuke was with Stuart. With Mr. Malthus, it is different. A close comparison of his writings shows that he knows and uses Anderson. He was in fact plagiarist by profession. One need only compare the first edition of his work on population with the work of the Reverend Townsend, which I have quoted previously, to be convinced that he does not work him over as an independent producer, but copies him and paraphrases him like a slavish plagiarist although he does not mention him anywhere by name and conceals his existence. The manner in which Malthus used Anderson is characteristic. Anderson had defended premiums on exports of corn and duties on corn imports, not out of any interest for the landlords, but because he believed that this type of legislation, quote, would reduce the average price of corn, end quote, and ensure an even development of the productive forces in agriculture. Malthus accepted this practical application of Anderson's because, being a staunch member of the established Church of England, he was a professional sycophant of the landed aristocracy, whose rents, sinecures, squandering, heartlessness, etc. he justified economically. Malthus defends the interest of the industrial bourgeoisie only insofar as these are identical with the interests of landed property, of the aristocracy, i.e. against the mass of the people, the proletariat. But where these interests diverge and are antagonistic to each other, he sides with the aristocracy against the bourgeoisie, hence his defense of the unproductive worker, overconsumption, etc. Anderson, on the other hand, explained the difference between land which pays rent and that which does not, or between lands which pay varying rents, by the relatively low fertility of the land which bears no rent, or a smaller rent compared with that which bears a rent, or greater rent. But he stated expressly that these degrees of relative productivity of different types of land, i.e. also the relatively low productivity of the worst types of land compared with the better, had absolutely nothing to do with the absolute productivity of agriculture. On the contrary, he stressed not only that the absolute productivity of all types of land could be constantly improved and must be improved with the progress in population, but he went further and asserted that the differences in productivity of various types of land can be progressively reduced. He said that the present degree of development of agriculture in England, 
gives no indication at all of its possibilities. That is why he said that in one country the prices of corn may be high and rent low, while in another country the price of corn may be low and rent may be high. And this is in accordance with his principle, since the level and the existence of rents is in both countries determined by the difference between the fertile and the unfertile land, in neither of them by the absolute fertility, in each only by the degree of difference in fertility of the existing types of land, and not by the average fertility of these types. From this, he concluded that the absolute fertility of agriculture has nothing to do with rent. Hence later, as we shall see below, he declared himself a decided adversary of the Malthusian theory of population, and it never dawned on him that his own theory of rent was to serve as the basis of this monstrosity. Anderson reasoned that the rise in corn prices in England between 1750 and 1801, as compared with the years 1700 to 1750, was by no means due to the cultivation of progressively less fertile types of land, but to the influence of legislation on agriculture during these two periods. What then did Malthus do? Instead of his also plagiarized chimera of the geometrical and arithmetical progression, which he retained as a phrase, he made Anderson's theory the confirmation of his population theory. He retained Anderson's practical application of the theory insofar as it was in the interests of the landlords. This fact alone proves that he understood as little of the connection of this theory with the system of bourgeois economy as Anderson himself. Without going into the counter-evidence which the discoverer of the theory put forward, he turned it against the proletariat. The theoretical and practical advances which could have been made from this theory were as follows. The theoretical, for the determination of the value of the commodity, etc., and gaining an insight into the nature of land ownership. The practical, against the necessity of the private ownership of land, on the basis of bourgeois production, and more immediately, against all state regulations such as corn laws, which enhanced this ownership of land. These advances from Anderson's theory, Malthus left to Ricardo. The one practical conclusion which he drew from it was a defense of the protective tariffs which the landlord demanded in 1815, a sycophantic service for the aristocracy, and a new justification for the poverty of the producers of wealth, a new apology for the exploiters of labor. In this respect, it was a sycophantic service for the industrial capitalists. Utter baseness is a distinctive trait of Malthus, a baseness which can only be indulged in by a person who sees human suffering as the punishment for sin, and who in any case needs a veil of tears on earth, but who at the same time, in view of the living he draws and aided by the dogma of predestination, finds it altogether advantageous to sweeten their sojourn in the veil of tears for the ruling classes. The baseness of this mind is also evident in his scientific work. Firstly, in his shameless and mechanical plagiarism. Secondly, in the cautious, not radical, conclusions which he draws from scientific premises. Section 2. Ricardo's fundamental principle in assessing economic phenomena is the development of the productive forces. Malthus defends the most reactionary elements of the ruling classes. Virtual refutation of Malthus's theory of population by Darwin. Ricardo, rightly for his time, regards the capitalist mode of production as the most advantageous for production in general, as the most advantageous for the creation of wealth. He wants production for the sake of production, and this with good reason. To assert, as sentimental opponents of Ricardo's did, that production as such is not the object, is to forget that production for its own sake means nothing but the development of human productive forces, in other words, the development of the richness of human nature as an end in itself. To oppose the welfare of the individual to this end, as Sismondi does, is to assert that the development of the species must be arrested in order to safeguard the welfare of the individual, so that, for instance, no war may be waged in which, at all events, some individuals perish. Sismondi is only right as against the economists who conceal or deny this contradiction. Apart from the barrenness of such edifying reflections, they reveal a failure to understand the fact that although at first the development of the capacities of the human species takes place at the cost of the majority of human individuals, and even classes, in the end it breaks through this contradiction and coincides with the development of the individual. The higher development of individuality is thus only achieved by a historical process during which individuals are sacrificed for the interests of the species in the human kingdom, as in the animal and plant kingdoms, 
always assert themselves at the cost of the interests of individuals, because these interests of the species coincide only with the interests of certain individuals, and it is this coincidence which constitutes the strength of these privileged individuals. Thus, Ricardo's ruthlessness was not only scientifically honest, but also a scientific necessity from his point of view. But because of this, it is also quite immaterial to him whether the advance of the productive forces slays landed property or workers. If this progress devalues the capital of the industrial bourgeoisie, it is equally welcome to him. If the development of the productive power of labor halves the value of the existing fixed capital, what does it matter, says Ricardo? The productivity of human labor has doubled. Thus, here is scientific honesty. Ricardo's conception is, on the whole, in the interests of the industrial bourgeoisie, only because and insofar as their interests coincide with that of production or the productive development of human labor. Where the bourgeoisie comes into conflict with this, he is just as ruthless towards it as he is at other times towards the proletariat and the aristocracy. But Malthus, this wretch only draws such conclusions from the given scientific premises, which he invariably steals, as will be agreeable, that is, useful, to the aristocracy against the bourgeoisie, and to both against the proletariat. He does not want production for the sake of production, but only insofar as it maintains or extends the status quo and serves the interests of the ruling classes. Already his first work, one of the most remarkable literary examples of the success of plagiarism at the cost of the original work, had the practical purpose to provide economic proof in the interests of the existing English government and the landed aristocracy that the tendency of the French Revolution and its adherents in England to perfect matters was utopian. In other words, it was a panegyric pamphlet for the existing conditions, against historical development, and furthermore, a justification of the war against revolutionary France. His writings of 1815 on protective tariffs and rent were partly means to confirm the earlier apology of the poverty of the producers, in particular, however, to defend reactionary landed property against enlightened liberal and progressive capital and especially to justify an intended retrogressive step in English legislation in the interests of the aristocracy against the industrial bourgeoisie. Finally, his principles of political economy directed against Ricardo had essentially the purpose of reducing the absolute demands of industrial capital and the laws under which its productivity develops to the desirable limits favorable to the existing interests of the landed aristocracy, the established church to which Malthus belonged, government pensioners, and consumers of taxes. But when a man seeks to accommodate science to a viewpoint which is derived not from science itself, however erroneous it may be, but from outside, from alien, external interests, then I call him base. It is not a base action when Ricardo puts the proletariat on the same level as machinery or beasts of burden or commodities, because from his point of view, their being purely machinery or beasts of burden is conducive to production, or because they really are mere commodities in bourgeois production. This is stoic, objective, and scientific. Insofar as it does not involve sinning against his science, Ricardo is always a philanthropist, just as he was in practice too. The parson, Malthus, on the other hand, reduces the worker to a beast of burden for the sake of production and even condemns him to death from starvation and to celibacy. But when these same demands of production curtail the landlord's rent or threaten to encroach on the tithes of the established church or in the interests of the consumers of taxes, and also when that part of the industrial bourgeoisie whose interests stand in the way of progress is being sacrificed to that part which represents the advance of production, and therefore, whenever it is a question of the interests of the aristocracy against the bourgeoisie, or of the conservative and stagnant bourgeoisie against the progressive, in all these instances, Parson Malthus does not sacrifice the particular interest to production, but seeks, as far as he can, to sacrifice the demands of production to the particular interests of existing ruling classes, or sections of classes. And to this end, he falsifies his scientific conclusions. This is his scientific baseness, his sin against science, quite apart from his shameless and mechanical plagiarism. The scientific conclusions of Malthus are considerate towards the ruling classes in general, and towards the reactionary elements of the ruling classes in particular. In other words, he falsifies science for those interests. But his conclusions are ruthless insofar as they concern the subjugated classes, 
He is not only ruthless, he affects ruthlessness. He takes a cynical pleasure in it and exaggerates his conclusions insofar as they are directed against the poor wretches, even beyond the point which would be scientifically justified from his point of view. The hatred of the English working classes for Malthus, the charlatan parson, as Cobbett rudely called him, Cobbett, though England's greatest political writer of this century, lacked the Leipzig professorial scholarship and was pronounced enemy of the learned language. This hatred of Malthus was thus fully justified, and the people's instinct was correct here, in that they felt he was no man of science, but a bought advocate of their opponents, a shameless sycophant of the ruling classes. The inventor of an idea may exaggerate it in all honesty. When the plagiarist exaggerates it, he always makes a business of such an exaggeration. Because the first edition of Malthus's work on population contains not a single new scientific word, it is to be regarded purely as an obtrusive Capuchin sermon, an Abraham, a Santa Clara version of the discoveries of Townsend, Stuart, Wallace, Herbert, etc. Since, in fact, it only wants to impress by its popular form, popular hate rightly turns against it. As compared to the wretched bourgeois economists who preach harmony, Malthus's only merit lies in his pointed emphasis on the disharmonies, which, though none of them were discovered by him, were all emphasized, amplified, and publicized by him with complacent sacerdotal cynicism. Charles Darwin, in the introduction to his On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, published in London in 1860, says the following, quote, In the next chapter, the struggle for existence amongst all organic beings throughout the world, which inevitably follows from the high geometrical ratio of their increase, will be treated of. This is the doctrine of Malthus applied to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms. In his splendid work, Darwin did not realize that by discovering the geometrical progression in the animal and plant kingdom, he overthrew Malthus's theory. Malthus's theory is based on the fact that he set Wallace's geometrical progression of man against the chimerical arithmetical progression of animals and plants. In Darwin's work, for instance, on the extinction of species, we also find, quite apart from his fundamental principle, the detailed refutation based on natural history of the Malthusian theory. But insofar as Malthus's theory rests upon Anderson's theory of rent, it was refuted by Anderson himself. Section 3. Roscher's Falsification of the History of Views on Ground Rent. Examples of Ricardo's Scientific Impartiality. Rent from capital investments in land, and rent from the exploitation of other elements of nature. The twofold influence of competition. Anderson's first publication, in which he develops the theory of rent as a byproduct, was a practical polemic, not on rent, but on protection. It appeared in 1777, and its very title, An Inquiry into the Nature of the Corn Laws, with a view to the new corn bill proposed for Scotland, shows firstly that it pursues a practical purpose, secondly that it is related to an imminent act of legislation, in which the interests of the manufacturers and the landlords are diametrically opposed. The law of 1773, in England to be looked up in Macaulay's catalogue, was due, so it appears, to be introduced into Scotland in 1777. Says Anderson, quote, the law of 1773 was constructed with the avowed intention of lowering the price of corn to our manufacturers by encouraging the importation of corn from abroad for the purpose of feeding our own people at a cheaper rate. Thus, Anderson's publication was a polemic on behalf of the interests of the agriculturalists, inclusive of the landlords, against the interests of the manufacturers, and he published it avowedly as such a partisan piece of writing. The theory of rent comes in here only incidentally, in his later writings, which are to a greater or lesser degree continuously concerned with this battle of interests, he merely repeats the theory of rent once or twice in passing. He never pretends to a scientific interest in it, and it does not even become an independent subject in his presentation. Accordingly, one may judge the correctness of the following remarks of Wilhelm Roscher, who was evidently not acquainted with Anderson's writings. Quote, Remarkable how a doctrine which in 1777 remained almost unnoticed was immediately defended and attacked with the greatest interest in 1815 and in the following years because it touched upon the contradiction between moneyed and landed interest, which had meanwhile so sharply developed. This sentence contains as many falsehoods as words. Firstly, unlike West, Malthus, and Ricardo, Anderson did not put forward his opinion as a doctrine. Secondly, it remained not almost but entirely unnoticed, 
Thirdly, it first came in incidentally in a work whose sole purpose it was to deal with the contradiction between manufacturers and landlords, a contradiction which was considerably developed in 1777, and the work only touched upon this practical battle of interests and left untouched the general theory of political economy. Fourthly, in 1815, one of the reproducers of this theory, that is Malthus, expounded it just as much in support of the Corn Laws as Anderson had done. The same doctrine was used in support of landed property by its discoverer and by Malthus, but was turned against landed property by Ricardo. Thus, at most, one might say that some of those who put it forward were defending the interests of landed property, while others who put it forward fought those same interests. But one could not say that this theory was attacked by the defenders of landed property in 1815, for Malthus defended it before Ricardo, or that it was defended by the attackers of landed property, for Ricardo did not have to defend this theory against Malthus, since he himself regarded Malthus as one of its discoverers and as his own forerunner. He only had to combat the practical conclusions that were drawn by Malthus. Fifthly, the contradiction between moneyed and landed interest, touched upon by Rusher, had, up to that moment, absolutely nothing to do either with Anderson's theory of rent or with its reproduction. As Rusher could have gathered from John Stuart Mill, by moneyed class, the Englishman understands firstly the money lenders, and secondly, these money lenders are people who live either altogether on interest or are money lenders by profession, such as bankers, bill brokers, etc. Mill also observes that all these people who form the moneyed class are opposed to, or at any rate are distinct from, the producing class, by which Mill understands industrial capitalists, besides the working men. Hence, Rosher should see that the interests of the producing class, including the manufacturers, the industrial capitalists, and the interests of the moneyed class are two very different matters, and that these classes are different classes. Furthermore, Rosher should see that a battle between the industrial capitalists and the landlords was thus by no means a battle between the moneyed interest and the landed interest. If Rosher knew the history of the Corn Laws of 1815 and the struggle over these, then he would already have known from Cobbett that the borough mongers, that is the landed interest, and the loan mongers, that is the moneyed interest, combined against the industrial interest. But Cobbett is crude. Furthermore, Rosher should know from the history of 1815 to 1847 that in the battle over the Corn Laws, the majority of the moneyed interest, and some even of the commercial interest, Liverpool for instance, were to be found amongst the allies of the landed interest against the manufacturing interest. At most, Rosher might have been surprised that the same doctrine served in favor of landed interest in 1777 and against it in 1815, and that it caused a stir only then. If I were to elucidate in equal detail all similar gross falsifications of history which Wilhelm Thucydides Rusher commits in his literary historical notes, then I would have to write as fat a volume as his Grundlagen, and indeed such a work would not be worth the paper it was written upon. But the harmful effects which such learned ignorance as that of a Wilhelm Thucydides can have on researchers in other fields of knowledge can be seen in the example of Herr Adolf Bastian. In his work, Der Mensch in der Geschichte, published in 1860, note he quotes the above sentence of Rosher as documentary proof for a psychological assertion. Incidentally, one cannot say of Bastian that the workmanship surpasses the material. Rather, in this case, the work does not master its own raw material. Besides, I have found out through the few sciences which I know that Herr Bastian, who knows all sciences, very often relies on such authorities as Wilhelm Thucydides, which is in any case unavoidable in a pantologist. I hope I shall not be accused of unkindness towards Rosher. Note the unkindness with which this pedant himself treats science. Anyhow, I have the same right to speak of his total untruths as he has to speak in his self-satisfied and condescending manner of Ricardo's half-truths. Furthermore, Wilhelm Thucydides is by no means honest in his research and cataloging. Anyone who is not respectable does not exist for him historically either. For instance, Rodbertus does not exist for him as a theoretician of rent, because he is a communist. Besides, Rusher is also inaccurate when it comes to respectable writers. For instance, Bailey exists for McCulloch, who even regards his work as epoch-making. For Wilhelm Thucydides Rusher, he does not exist. If the science of political economy is to be furthered and popularized in Germany, people like Rodbertus should found a journal which would be open to all scholars, not pedants, prigs, and vulgarizers, and whose main purpose it would be to demonstrate the ignorance of these specialists in the science itself, as well as in its history. 
Anderson was in no way concerned with any inquiry into the relationship of his theory of rent to the system of political economy. This is not in the least surprising, since his first book appeared one year after Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, i.e. at a moment when the system of political economy was only first being consolidated, for Stewart's system too had only appeared a few years before. But so far as the material is concerned, which Anderson examined within the confines of the specific subject he was considering, this was decidedly more extensive than Ricardo's. Just as in his theory of money, the reproduction of Hume's theory, Ricardo specifically only took into account the events from 1797 to 1809, so in the theory of rent, the reproduction of Anderson's theory, he considered only the economic phenomena relating to the rise in corn prices between 1800 and 1815. The following paragraphs are very important, because they clearly reflect Ricardo's character. Quote, I shall greatly regret that considerations for any particular class are allowed to check the progress of the wealth and population of the country. He says that with free import of corn, land is abandoned. In other words, landed property is sacrificed to the development of production. In connection with the free import of corn, he writes, however, that some capital would be lost cannot be disputed, but is the possession or preservation of capital the end or the means? The means, undoubtedly. What we want is an abundance of commodities, wealth in general. And if it could be proved that by the sacrifice of a part of our capital, we should augment the annual produce of those objects which contribute to our enjoyment and happiness, we ought not to repine at the loss of a part of our capital. Ricardo now terms as our capital, that capital which belongs neither to us nor to him, but which has been permanently invested in the land by the capitalists. But we signifies a cross-section of the nation. The increase in our wealth is the increase in social wealth, which is an end as such, irrespective of who are the participants in this wealth. To an individual with a capital of £20,000, whose profits were £2,000 per annum, it would be a matter quite indifferent whether his capital would employ a hundred or a thousand men, whether the commodity produced sold for £10,000 or for £20,000, provided, in all cases, his profits were not diminished below £2,000. Is not the real interest of the nation similar? Provided its net real income, its rent and profits, be the same, it is of no importance whether the nation consists of ten or twelve millions of inhabitants. Here, the proletariat is sacrificed to wealth. Insofar as it is irrelevant to the existence of wealth, its existence is a matter of indifference to wealth. Here, mass, as in mass of human beings, is worth nothing. These three instances exemplify Ricardo's scientific impartiality. The element in which the capital employed in agriculture is invested is the soil, that is nature. Hence, rent is here equal to the excess of the value of the product of labor created in this element over its average price. If, on the other hand, an element of nature or material which is privately owned by an individual is employed in another sphere of production whose physical basis it does not form, then the rent, if it only comes into being through the enjoyment of this element, cannot consist in the excess of the value of this product over the average price, but only in the excess of the general average price of this product over its own average price. For instance, a waterfall may replace the steam engine for a manufacturer and save him consumption of coal. While in possession of this waterfall, he would, for instance, constantly be selling yarn above its average price and making an excess profit. If the waterfall belongs to a landowner, this excess profit accrues to him as rent. Mr. Hopkins, in his book on rent, observes that in Lancashire, the waterfalls not only yield rent, but according to the degree of the natural mode of power, they yield differential rent. Here, rent is purely the excess of the average market price of the product over its individual average price. In competition, there are two distinct movements towards equalization. Capitals within the same sphere of production equalize the prices of the commodities produced within this sphere to the same market price, irrespective of the relationship of the value of these commodities to this price. The average market price should equal the value of the commodity, were it not for the equalization between different spheres of production. As between these different spheres, competition equalizes the values to the average prices, insofar as the reciprocal interaction of the capitals is not hampered or disrupted by a third element, land ownership, etc. Section 4. Rodbertus's error regarding the relation between value and surplus value when the costs of production rise. Rodbertus is altogether mistaken when he thinks that because one commodity is dearer than another, thus realizing more labor time, it must, therefore, given the same rate of surplus value or the equal exploitation of the workers in the different spheres, also contain more unpaid labor time, surplus labor time. 
If the same labor yields one quarter on unfertile land and three on fertile, in a good or bad year alike, if the same labor yields one ounce of gold in land very rich in gold, whereas in less rich or exhausted land it only yields a third of an ounce, if the same labor time which produces one pound of wool spins three pounds of wool, then to begin with, the values of the one quarter and the three quarters, of the one ounce of gold and the third ounce, of the one pound of wool and the three pounds of wool and yarn, minus the value of the wool it contains, are of equal magnitude. They contain equal quantities of labor time, therefore, according to the assumption, equal quantities of surplus labor time. True, the quantity of surplus labor embodied in the one quarter grown on unfertile land is greater, but then it is only one quarter, whereas in the other case it is three quarters, or one pound of wool, whereas in the other case it is three pounds of wool and yarn. The volume of surplus labor is therefore the same, and the proportional quantity of surplus value comparing the individual commodities with one another is also equal. According to the assumption, the amount of labor contained in the one quarter, or the one pound of wool, is the same as that contained in the three quarters, or the three pounds of yarn. The capital laid out in wages is therefore greater to exactly the same degree as the surplus value. The one pound of wool contains three times as much labor as the one pound of yarn. Though the surplus value is three times as great, the capital laid out in wages on which it is based is also three times as great. The proportion thus remains the same. Rodbertus calculates quite wrongly here, or wrongly compares the capital laid out in wages with the greater or lesser quantity of commodities which these wages represent. But this calculation is completely wrong if, as he presupposes, wages or the rate of surplus value are given. The same quantity of labor, say 12 hours, may result in X or 3X commodities. In one case, 1X commodities contain as much labor and surplus labor as 3X in the other, but in no case would more than one working day be spent, and in no case would the rate of surplus value be more than, say, one-fifth. In the first instance, one-fifth of the one X would be to the X, as in the second, one-fifth of the three X would be to the three X. And if we were to call each of the three X's, X prime, X prime prime, and X prime prime prime, then there would be four-fifths paid and one-fifth unpaid labor in each X prime, X prime prime, etc., it is quite right, on the other hand, that if just as much commodity were to be produced under the unproductive conditions as under more productive, the commodity would contain more labor, and so also more surplus labor. But then proportionately, a greater capital would also have to be laid out. In order to produce 3x, three times as much capital would have to be laid out in wages as is required to produce 1x. Now it is true that manufacture cannot work up more raw material than agriculture supplies. Thus, for instance, it cannot spin more pounds of wool than have been produced. If the productivity in wool spinning is tripled, then provided the conditions of the production of wool remain the same, three times as much time as previously would now have to be spent. Three times as much capital would have to be expended on labor in wool production, whereas only the same amount of the spinner's labor time would be required to spin up his tripled quantity of wool. But the rate of surplus value would remain the same. The same spinning labor would have the same value as before, and contain the same surplus value. The wool-producing labor would have a tripled surplus value, but the labor embodied in it, or the capital advanced in wages, would accordingly have tripled as well. The three times greater surplus value would thus be calculated on a three times greater capital. But this is no reason for saying that the rate of surplus value is lower in spinning than in wool production. One would only say that the capital laid out in wages is three times as great in one as in the other, since it is assumed here that the changes in the spinning and in the production of wool are not due to any change in their constant capital. It is necessary to make a distinction here. The same labor plus constant capital gives a smaller output in an unfavorable than a favorable season, in unproductive than in productive soil, in a poorer than in a richer mine. In the former case, the product is thus dearer, contains more labor and more surplus labor in the same number of products. But in the latter case, the number of these products is the greater. Furthermore, the ratio between paid and unpaid labor in each individual product in the two categories is not affected by this, for though the individual product contains less unpaid labor, according to the assumption, it also contains less paid labor in the same proportion. For it has been assumed here that there is no change in the proportions of the organic component parts of the capital, of variable and constant capital. It is assumed that the same amount of variable and constant capital supplies varying, greater or smaller, quantities of product under varying conditions. Rodbertus appears to confuse this all the time, and as a matter of course to conclude from the mere increase in the price of the product that it contains a greater surplus value. 
As to the rate, this is wrong even according to the assumption. As to the total, however, it is only right if more capital is advanced in one case than in the other. That means if as much is produced now of the dearer product as previously of the cheaper, or if the increased quantity of the cheaper product, as above with spinning, presupposes a correspondingly increased quantity of the dearer product. Section 5. Ricardo's Denial of Absolute Rent, a result of his error in the theory of value. That rent, hence also the value of land, can rise, although the rate of rent remains the same or even decreases, that therefore the productivity of agriculture also increases, this Ricardo sometimes forgets, though he knows it. Anyhow, Anderson knows it, and Petty and Davenant already knew it. That is not the question. Ricardo abstracts from the question of absolute rent, which he denies on theoretical grounds, because he starts out from the false assumption that if the value of commodities is determined by labor time, the average prices of commodities must equal their values, which is why he comes to the wrong practical conclusion, that competition from more fertile types of land must throw the less fertile out of cultivation, even if they bore rent previously. If values of commodities and average prices of commodities were identical, then absolute rent, i.e. rent on the worst cultivated land, or on that originally cultivated, would be equally impossible. What is the average price of the commodity? The total capital, being constant plus variable, laid out in its production, plus the labor time contained in the average profit, say 10%. Supposing that a capital produced a higher value than the average price, just because it was operating in a particular element, an element of nature, say land, then the value of this commodity would be above its value, and this excess value would contradict the conception of value being equal to a certain quantity of labor time. An element of nature, something heterogeneous from social labor time, would be creating value, but this cannot be. Hence capital invested in land pure and simple cannot bear a rent. The worst land is land pure and simple. If the better land bears a rent, then this only shows that the difference between the individually necessary labor and that which is socially necessary becomes permanently established in agriculture because it has a natural basis, whereas in industry it is constantly disappearing. Absolute rent cannot be permitted to exist, but only differential rent. To admit the existence of absolute rent would be to admit that the same quantity of labor, materialized, laid out in constant capital, and bought with wages, creates varying values according to the element in which the labor is expended, or according to the material which it works up. But if one admits this diversity in value, although in each sphere of production the same amount of labor time materializes itself in the product, then one admits that value is not determined by labor time but by something heterogeneous. These different magnitudes of value would invalidate the concept of value. They would invalidate the proposition that the substance of value is social labor time. Hence, its differences can only be quantitative, and these quantitative differences can only be equal to the differences in the amounts of social labor time applied. The maintenance of value, the determination not only of the amount of value by the varying amount of labor time, but also of the substance of value by social labor, thus requires the denial of absolute rent. The denial of absolute rent can, however, be expressed in two ways. Firstly, the worst land cannot bear a rent. The rent from the better types of land can be explained as arising from the market price, which is the same for products which have been produced on more favorable types of land as for those which have been produced on less favorable. But the worst land is land pure and simple. It is not differentiated in itself. It differs from industrial capital investment only in that it is a special sphere of capital investment. If it bore rent, then this would arise from the fact that the same quantity of labor would produce different values if applied in different spheres of production. This means that the quantity of labor in itself does not determine the value, and products which contain the same amount of labor are not equal in terms of value. Secondly, one might say that the land which was cultivated originally must not bear rent. For what is the originally cultivated land? The land which is originally cultivated is neither better nor worse land. It is land pure and simple, undifferentiated land. Originally, capital investment in agriculture can only differ from investment in industry because of the spheres in which these capitals are invested. But since equal quantities of labor are represented in equal values, there is absolutely no reason why the capital invested in land should yield a rent in addition to profit, unless the same quantity of labor applied in this sphere produced a higher value, so that the excess of this value over the value yielded in manufacture would produce an excess profit, equal to rent. But this would amount to saying, that the land as such creates value, thus invalidating the concept of value itself.
The land which is cultivated originally, therefore, cannot originally bear a rent, if the whole theory of value is not to be discarded. Furthermore, this ties up very easily, although not necessarily, as Anderson shows, with the idea that originally people of course chose not the worst, but rather the best land for cultivation. With the advance of civilization and population, the land which originally bears no rent does so at a later stage, because people are forced to descend to worse types of land. And thus, in this descent to Avernus, to ever worse land, rent must arise on the originally cultivated, most fertile land, and then step by step on the land which follows it, while the worst land, which always represents simply land, the particular sphere of capital investment, never bears a rent. All this has a more or less logical coherence. If, on the other hand, one knows that average prices and values are not identical, that the average price of a commodity may be either equal to its value, or bigger or smaller, then the question, the problem itself, disappears, and with it also the hypotheses for its solution. The only remaining question is why, in agriculture, the value of the commodity, or at any rate its price, is above its average price, though not above its value. But this question no longer bears any relation to the fundamentals of the theory, the determination of value as such. Ricardo knows, of course, that the relative values of commodities are modified according to the varying proportion of fixed capital and capital laid out in wages, which enter into their production. But these are not opposites. Fixed capital and circulating capital are opposites, and circulating capital comprises not only wages but also raw materials and auxiliary materials. For example, the same ratio may exist between capital laid out in wages and fixed capital in the mining and fishing industries, as between that laid out in wages and in raw materials in tailoring. But Ricardo also knows that these relative values are equalized by competition. In fact, he only makes the differentiation so that the same average profit should result from these different capital investments. In other words, these relative values of which he speaks are only the average prices. It does not even occur to him that value and average price are different. He only gets as far as their identity. Since, however, this identity does not exist when the ratio of the organic component parts of capital varies, he accepts it as an unexplained fact brought about by competition. Hence, too, he does not come up against the question, why do the values of agricultural products not equalize in average prices? On the contrary, he assumes that they do so, and poses the problem from that point of view. It is quite incomprehensible why people a la Wilhelm Rascher should be so ardently for Ricardo's theory of rent. From their point of view, Ricardo's half-truths, as Thucydides condescendingly calls them, lose their whole value. For Ricardo, the problem only exists because value is determined by labor time. With those people, this is not the case. According to Rascher, nature as such has value. See later. In other words, he has absolutely no idea what value is. What prevents him, therefore, from allowing the value of land to enter into production costs from the outset and to form the rent? What prevents him from presupposing the value of land, i.e. rent, as an explanation for rent? With these people, the phrase production costs is meaningless. We see this with say. The value of the commodity is determined by the costs of production, capital, land, labor. But these are determined by demand and supply. In other words, no determination is taking place. Since the land performs productive services, why should not the price of these services be determined by demand and supply, just as these services performed by labor or capital? And since the land services are in the possession of certain sellers, why should their article not have a market price? In other words, why should not rent exist as an element of price? One can see how lame a reason Wilhelm Thucydides had for getting so well-meaningly vexed over the Ricardian theory. Section 6. Ricardo's Thesis on the Constant Rise in Corn Prices. Table of Annual Average Prices of Corn from 1641 to 1859. But apart from absolute rent, the following question remains for Ricardo. The population grows, and with it the demand for agricultural products. Therewith, their price rises, as happens in similar cases in industry. But in industry, this rise in price ceases as soon as demand has become effective and brought about an increased supply of commodities. The product now falls to the old, or rather below the old, level of value. But in agriculture, this additional product is thrown onto the market neither at the same price nor at a lower price. It costs more and effects a constant rise in market prices, and along with that, a raising of rent. How is this to be explained if not by the fact that ever less fertile types of land are being used, 
that ever more labor is required in order to produce the same product, that agriculture becomes progressively more sterile. Why, apart from the influence of the depreciation of money, did agricultural products rise in England from 1797 to 1815, with the rapid development of the population? That they fell again later proves nothing. That supplies from foreign markets were cut off proves nothing. On the contrary, this in fact created the right conditions for demonstrating the effect of the law of rent as such. For it was the very cutting off of foreign supplies which forced the country to have recourse to ever less fertile land. This cannot be explained by an absolute increase in rent, because not only did the rental rise, but also the rate of rent, the quarter of wheat, etc., rose in price. It cannot be explained by depreciation, because although this might well explain why, with greater productivity and industry, industrial products fell, hence why the relative price of agricultural products rose, it would not explain why, in addition to this relative rise, the prices of agricultural products were continuously rising absolutely. Similarly, it cannot be explained as a consequence of the fall in the rate of profit. This would never explain a change in prices, but only a change in the distribution of value, or distribution of price, between landlord, manufacturer, and worker. So far as depreciation is concerned, assume that one pound now equals two pounds. A quarter of wheat, which was previously equal to two pounds, is now equal to four pounds. If the industrial product fell to one-tenth, and previously its value was twenty shillings, then it would now be two shillings but these two shillings are now equal to four shillings. But quite apart from all this, it can be assumed that considering the state of agriculture at that time, unfertile land for wheat was being cultivated. The same land was later fertile, in that the rate of differential rents decreased, as is proved by the best barometer, namely wheat prices. The highest prices occur in the years 1800, 1801, 1811, and 1812. The first were years of poor growth, the second years of the peak of depreciation. Similarly, 1817 and 18 were years of depreciation, but if these years are omitted, probably what was left would give the average price. In comparing wheat prices, etc., in different periods, it is at the same time important to compare the amounts produced at so much per quarter, because this shows to what extent the additional production of corn influences the price. The following tables will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult Section 6 of Chapter 9 of a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. Section 7. Hopkins' Conjecture about the difference between absolute rent and differential rent. Explanation of rent by the private ownership of land. Hopkins grasps correctly the difference between absolute and differential rent. Quote, the principle of competition, which renders it impossible that there should be two rates of profit in the same country, does determine their relative rents, but not the general average of rent. Hopkins makes the following distinction between productive and unproductive labor, or, as he says, between primary and secondary. If all laborers were employed for the same end or object as the diamond cutter and the opera singer, in a short time there would be no wealth to subsist them, because none of the wealth produced would then become capital. If a considerable proportion were so employed, wages would be low, because but a comparatively small part of what was produced would be used as capital. But if only a few of the laborers were so employed, and of course nearly all were plowmen, shoemakers, weavers, etc., then much capital would be produced and wages would be proportionally high. With the diamond cutter and the singer must be classed all those who labor for the landlords and who receive a part of their income as wages all in fact whose labors terminate merely in producing those things which gratify landlords, and who receive in return for their labors a part of the rent of the landlord. These are all productive workers, but all their labors are for the purpose of converting wealth which exists in the shape of rents and annuities into some other form, that shall in the other form more gratify the landlord, and therefore they are secondary producers. All other laborers are primary producers. Diamonds and song are both congealed labor, and can, like all commodities, be converted into money, and as money into capital. But in this transformation of money into capital, we must distinguish two things. All commodities can be converted into money, and as money, into capital, because in the form of money, their use value and their particular natural form become extinct. They are materialized labor in that social form in which it is exchangeable for any real labor, therefore convertible into any form of real labor. On the other hand, whether the commodities which are the product of labor can as such become elements of productive capital once again, 
depends on whether the nature of their use values permits them to re-enter the process of production, be it as objective conditions of labor, tools and material, or as subjective conditions, the means of subsistence of the worker, in other words, as elements of constant or variable capital. In Ireland, according to a moderate estimate and the census of 1821, the whole net produce which goes to the landlords, the government, and the tithe owners amounts to 20 and three-quarter million pounds. The whole wages, however, only to 14.1 million. Quote, The cultivators in Italy, generally paying from one-half to more than one-half of the produce as rent to the landlord, with moderate skill in agriculture and a scanty supply of fixed capital, the greater part of the population is composed of secondary producers and proprietors, and generally the primary producers are a poor and degraded class. The same was the case in France under Louis XIV. According to Young, rent, tithes, and taxes amounted to 140.9 million pounds. Cultivation, moreover, was very poor. The population of France at this time is stated to have been 26.4 million. Now, if there had been six millions of laboring families, which is too high a figure, each family would have had to furnish annually, either directly or indirectly, an average of upwards of 23 pounds of net wealth to the landlords. According to Young, and taking into account various other factors, the laboring family produced annually 42 pounds, 10 shillings, 23 of which were paid away to others, and 19 pounds and 10 shillings remained to subsist itself. The Dependence of the Population on Capital Quote, the error of Mr. Malthus and his followers is to be found in the assumption that a reduction of the laboring population would not be followed by a correspondent reduction of capital. Mr. Malthus forgets that this demand for workers is limited by the means of paying wages, and that these means do not arise spontaneously, but are always previously created by labor. This conception of the accumulation of capital is correct, but the means can grow, i.e. the quantity of surplus produce or surplus labor can grow, without a proportionate growth in the quantity of labor. Quote, it is somewhat extraordinary that there is a strong inclination to represent net wealth as beneficial to the working class because it gives employment, though it is evidently not on account of being net that it has that power, but because it is wealth, wealth which has been brought into existence by labor, while at the same time an additional quantity of labor is represented as injurious to the working classes, though that labor produces three times as much as it consumes. If by use of superior machines, the whole primary produce could be raised from 200 to 250 or 300, while net wealth and profit took only 140, it is clear that there would remain, as a fund for the wages of the primary producers, 110 or 160 instead of 60. The conditions of workers is rendered bad either by crippling their productive power or by taking from them what they have produced. No, says Mr. Malthus, the weight of your burden has nothing whatever to do with your distress. That arises solely from there being too many persons carrying it. In the general principle, then, that cost of production regulates the exchangeable value of all commodities, original materials are not included, but the claim which the owners of these have upon produce causes rent to enter into value. Rent, or a charge for use, arises naturally out of ownership or the establishment of a right of property. Anything may yield a rent if possessed of the following qualities. First, it must exist in a degree of scarcity. Secondly, it must have the power to aid labor in the great work of production. Of course, one must not take the case where land is so plentiful compared with the labor and stock to be employed upon it that no charge for rent could be made because it was not scarce. The landowner may obtain, in some countries, 50%, in others, 10%. In some of the fertile regions of the East, man can subsist upon one-third of the produce of his labor employed upon the land. But in parts of Switzerland and Norway, an exaction of 10% might depopulate the country. We see no natural bounds to the rent that may be exacted, but in the limited abilities of the payers. And where inferior soils exist, the competition of those inferior soils against the superior. There is much common land in England, the natural fertility of which is equal to what a large part of the land now cultivated was prior to its being taken into cultivation. And yet the expense of bringing such common lands into cultivation is so great as to cause them not to yield the ordinary interest for the money expended in improving them, leaving nothing as rent for the natural fertility of the soil. And this, with all the advantages of an immediate application of labor, aided by stock skillfully applied, and furnished with manufactures cheaply produced, added to the very important circumstance of good roads being already formed in the neighborhood, the present landed proprietors may be considered the owners of all the accumulated labor which has for ages been expending in bringing the country to its present productive state. 
This is a very important circumstance in relation to rent, especially when the population suddenly grows significantly, as it did from 1780 to 1815, consequent upon the advance in industry, and hence a large portion of hitherto uncultivated land is suddenly brought into cultivation. The newly cultivated land may be as fertile as or even more fertile than the old land was, before centuries of cultivation had accumulated in it. But what is demanded of the new land, if this product is not to be sold at a dearer price, is that its fertility must be equal firstly to the natural fertility of the cultivated land, and secondly to the artificial fertility which has been engendered by cultivation, but which has now become its natural fertility. The newly cultivated land would thus have to be much more fertile than the old had been before its cultivation. But it will be said, the fertility of the cultivated land originates in the first place from its natural fertility. Thus it depends on the natural condition of the newly cultivated land, whether or not it possesses this fertility arising from and owing to nature. In either case, it costs nothing. The other part of the fertility of cultivated land is an artificial product, owing to cultivation, the investment of capital. But this part of productivity involves costs of production which are repaid as interest on the fixed capital which has been sunk into the land. This part of rent is merely interest on the fixed capital tied up in the land. Hence, it enters into the cost of production of the product of the previously cultivated land. Hence, only the same capital needs to be thrown into the newly cultivated land for it to obtain this second part of fertility. And as with the first, the interest on the capital which has been employed to bring forth this fertility will enter into the price of the product. Why then should it not be possible to cultivate new land, unless it is more fertile, without the price of the product rising? If the natural fertility is the same, then the difference is brought about only by the capital invested. And in both cases alike, the interest on this capital enters into the cost of production to the same extent. However, this reasoning is wrong. A portion of the cost of bringing the land into cultivation is no longer liable to be paid for, because, as Ricardo has already observed, the fertility thus created has partly coalesced with the natural quality of the soil. This applies to the costs of clearing, draining, leveling, the chemical change of the soil resulting from continued chemical processes, etc. Thus, if the product of the newly cultivated land is to sell at the same price as that of the last cultivated land, the land must be sufficiently fertile for this price to cover that part of the cost of bringing it into cultivation which enters into its own cost of production, but which have ceased to enter into the cost of the previously cultivated land, because it has coalesced with the natural fertility of the land. Quote, a stream, favorably situated, furnishes an instance of rent being paid for an appropriated gift of nature, of as exclusive a kind as any that can be named. This is well understood in manufacturing districts, where considerable rents are paid for small streams of water, particularly if the fall is considerable. The power obtained from such streams being equal to that afforded by large steam engines, it is as advantageous to use them, though subject to the payment of a heavy rent, as it is to expend large sums in the erection and working of steam engines. Of streams, too, there are some larger, some smaller. Contiguity to the seat of manufacture is also an advantage which commands a higher rent. In the countries of York and Lancaster, there is probably a much greater difference between the rents paid for the smallest and the largest streams of water than there is between the rents paid for 50 of the least and 50 of the most fertile acres that are in common cultivation. Section 8. The Costs of Bringing Land into Cultivation periods of rising and periods of falling corn prices, 1641 to 1859. If we compare the average prices given earlier and deduct firstly what is due to depreciation, 1809 to 13, and secondly what is due to particularly bad seasons such as 1800 and 1801, then we shall find that a very important element is the amount of new land cultivated at a given moment or during a given period. A rise in price on the cultivated land here indicates a growth in population, and hence an excess in price as compared with costs. On the other hand, the same increase in demand brings about the cultivation of fresh land. If proportionately the amount of newly cultivated land has greatly increased, then the rising price, and the higher price, in the early period merely shows that a large part of the costs of bringing land into cultivation enters into the additional quantity of food produced. If the price had not risen, this production of additional food would not have taken place. Its effect, a fall in price, can only come into evidence later, because the price of the recently created food comprises an element of the cost of production or price that has long become extinct in the older applications of capital to land, or in the older portions of cultivated soil, 
the difference would be even greater if consequence upon the increased productivity of labor, the cost of appropriating soil to cultivation had not greatly fallen, as compared to the cost of cultivation in former bygone periods. The transformation of new land, whether more or equally or less fertile than old land, into such a state, and this state is given by the general rate of adaptation to culture prevailing on the existing land under cultivation, as to make it suitable for the application of capital and labor, under the same conditions under which capital and labor is employed on the average quantity of cultivated soil, this adaptation must be paid for by the costs of converting wasteland into cultivated land. This difference of cost must be borne by the new cultivated land. If it does not enter into the price of its produce, there are only two cases possible under which such a result can be realized. Either the produce of the newly cultivated land is not sold at its real value, its price stands below its value, as is in fact the case with most of the land bearing no rent, because its price is not constituted by its own value, but by the value of the produce derived from more fertile soils. Or, the newly cultivated land must be so fertile that if it was sold at its imminent own value, according to the quantity of labor realized in it, it would be sold at a less price than the price of produce grown on the formerly cultivated soil. If the difference between the inherent value of its product and the market price settled by the value of the cultivated soil is such that it amounted, for instance, to 5%, and if, on the other hand, the interest entering into its cost of production on the part of the capital employed to bring it up to the level of productive ability common to the old soils amounted also to 5%, then the newly cultivated land would grow produce, which at the old market price would be able to pay the usual wages, profits, and rents. If the interest of the capital employed amounted to 4% only, while its degree of fertility exceeded 4%, as compared to the older soils, the market price, after the deduction of the 4% interest for the capital employed to bring the new land into a cultivatable state, would leave a surplus, or it might be sold at a lower price than the market price settled by the value of the least fruitful soil. Rents, consequently, would generally be lowered, together with the market price of the produce. Absolute rent is excess of value over the average price of raw produce. Differential rent is the excess of the market price of the produce grown on favored soils over the value of their own produce. If, therefore, the price of raw produce rises or remains constant in periods in which a relatively large part of the additional food, required by the increase of population, is produced on soil which from uncultivated state has been converted into a state of cultivation, this constancy or rise of prices does not prove that the fertility of the land has decreased, but only that it is not increased to such a degree as to counteract the fresh element of production, formed by the interest of capital applied with a view to bringing the uncultivated land to a level of the common conditions of production, under which the old soils, in a given state of development, are cultivated. If the relative quantity of the newly cultivated soil is different in different periods, then even a constant or rising price does not prove that the new soil is unfertile or yields less produce, but only that an element of cost, which has become extinct in the old cultivated soils, enters into the value of the products of the newly cultivated land. This new element of cost, moreover, remains, although under the new conditions of production, the costs of bringing in new soil into cultivation have fallen considerably, compared with the costs of bringing the old soil from its original, natural state of fertility to its present state. It is therefore necessary to establish the relative proportion of enclosures during the different periods. The above list, moreover, shows that of the ten-year periods examined, the period 1641 to 1649 reaches a higher level than any other 10-year period up to 1860, with the exception of the 10-year periods 1800 to 1809 and 1810 to 1819. So far as the 50-year periods are concerned, that of 1650 to 1699 is at a higher level than that of 1700 to 1749, and that of 1750 to 1799 higher than that of 1700 and 1749, and lower than that of 1800 to 1849. Prices constantly fall in the period from 1810 to 1859, Whereas in the period from 1750 to 99, despite the lower average price over the 50 years, an upward movement takes place. The upward movement is just as consistent as the downward movement between 1810 and 1859. In fact, compared with the period of 1641 to 49, there is, on the whole, a continuous fall in 10-year average prices, until this fall reaches its lowest point in the last two 10-year periods of the first half of the 18th century. From the middle of the 18th century onwards, an upward movement takes place. It commences from a price which is lower than the 50 years average price of the second half of the 17th century, 
and approximately corresponds to, or is, a little higher than the average price of the 50-year period from 1700 to 49, the first half of the 18th century. This upward movement continues at an increasing pace in the two 10-year periods from 1800 to 1809 and 1810 to 1819. In the latter, it reaches its acme. From that point on, the consistent downward movement begins again. If we take the average of the period of rise from 1750 to 1819, then its average price, a little over 57 shillings per quarter, is equal to the starting point of the period of fall from 1820, namely a little over 58 shillings, for the 10-year period 1820 to 1829. Just as the starting point for the second half of the 18th century equals the average price of its first half. Any mathematical example will show how individual circumstances, a poor harvest, depreciation of money, etc., can affect the average figure. For instance, 30 plus 20 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 is 65. The average is 13, although the last three numbers here are always only equal to 5. As against this, 12, 11, 10, 9, and 8 being 50, the average is 10. Although if one struck off the exceptional 30 and 20 in the first series, the average of any three years in the second series would be greater than the first. If one deducts the differential cost for the capital successively employed in bringing new land into cultivation, which for a certain period enters as an item into cost, then perhaps the prices of 1820 to 59 would be lower than any of the earlier ones. And this, to some extent, may well be the notion in the heads of those people who explain rent as interest for fixed capital sunk into the soil. Section 9. Anderson versus Malthus. Anderson's definition of rent. His thesis of the rising productivity of agriculture and its influence on differential rent. Anderson says in a calm investigation of the circumstances that have led to the present scarcity of grain in Britain, published in London in 1801, quote, From 1700 to 1750, there has been a regular fall of price from two pounds, 18 shillings and one pence, to one pound, 12 shillings and six pence per quarter of wheat. From 1750 to 1780, progressional rise from one pound, 12 shillings and six pence, to five pounds and 10 shillings per quarter. Thus, unlike West, Malthus, and Ricardo, he did not one-sidedly consider the phenomenon of a rising scale of corn prices, that is from 1750 to 1813, but rather the double phenomenon, a whole century, of which the first half shows a constantly falling, and the second half a constantly rising, scale of corn prices. He says very definitely, quote, The population was on the increase during the first half of this century, as well as the last. He is a decided enemy of the theory of population and says explicitly that the land is capable of increasing and perennial improvement. The soil can be continuously improved by chemical influences in cultivation. Under a judicious system of management, that productiveness may be made to augment from year to year for a succession of time to which no limits can be assigned, till at last it may be made to attain a degree of productiveness of which we cannot perhaps at this time conceive an idea. It may be with certainty said that the present population is such a trifle compared to that which this island can maintain as to be below any degree of serious consideration. Wherever population increases, the produce of the country must be augmented along with it, unless some moral influence is permitted to derange the economy of nature. Anderson says that the theory of population represents the most pernicious prejudice. Anderson seeks to prove historically that the productivity of agriculture rises with a growing and falls with a declining population. With the correct conception of rent, the first point to arise was of course that it does not originate from the land, but from the product of agriculture, that is, from labor, from the price of the product of labor, for instance of wheat. In other words, from the value of the agricultural product, from the labor applied to the land, not from the land, and Anderson quite correctly emphasizes this. It is not the rent of the land that determines the price of its produce, but it is the price of that produce which determines the rent of the land, although the price of that produce is often highest in those countries where the rent of land is lowest. Rent has thus nothing to do with the absolute productivity of agriculture. This seems to be a paradox that deserves to be explained. In every country there is a variety of soils, differing considerably from one another in point of fertility. These we shall at present suppose arranged into different classes, which we shall denote by the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. 
the class A comprehending the soils of the greatest fertility, and the other letters expressing different classes of soils, gradually decreasing in fertility as you recede from the first. Now, as the expense of cultivating the least fertile soil is as great or greater than that of the most fertile field, it necessarily follows that if an equal quantity of corn, the produce of each field, can be sold at the same price, the profit on cultivating the most fertile soil must be much greater than that of cultivating the others. Namely, the excess of price over the expenses, or the price of the capital advanced. And as this, i.e. the profit, continues to decrease as the sterility increases, it must at length happen that the expense of cultivating some of the inferior classes will equal the value of the whole produce. What Anderson calls value of the whole produce is evidently nothing other than his conception of the market price at which the product is sold, whether it grows on better or on worse land. With the more fertile types of land, this price, or value, leaves a greater or lesser excess over the expenses. This does not apply to the last product. Here, the average price, i.e. that formed by the costs of production plus the average profit, coincides with the market price of the product. Hence, it does not yield an excess profit, which alone can constitute rent. With Anderson, rent equals the excess of the market price of the product over its average price. The theory of value as yet does not worry Anderson at all. Thus, if, as a result of the particularly low fertility of the land, the average price of the product of this land coincides with the market price of the product, then there is no excess, and therefore no fund for the formation of rent. Anderson does not say the last cultivated land cannot bear a rent. He only says that if it happens that the expenses, that is the costs of production plus the average profit, are so great that the difference between the market price of the product and its average price disappears, then rent also disappears, and that this must be the case if one descends ever further down the scale. Anderson says expressly that a definite market price equal for the quantities of produce that have been produced under more favorable or less favorable conditions of production is the prerequisite for this formation of rent. He says that a surplus profit, or excess of profit, from the better types of soil over that of the worse necessarily follows, quote, if an equal quantity of corn, the produce of each field, can be sold at the same price, end quote, i.e. if a general market price is presupposed. Anderson by no means assumes, as might have appeared from the preceding passage, that different degrees of fertility are merely the product of nature. On the contrary, the infinite diversity of the soils arises partly from the fact that, quote, these soils may be so much altered from their original state by the modes of culture they have been formerly subjected to, by the manures, etc., on the one hand, the progress in the productivity of labor in general makes it easier to bring land into cultivation. On the other hand, cultivation increases the diversity of soils, in that the original fertility of land A, which is cultivated, and land B, which is not, may have been the same if we deduct from A's fertility that part which, though it is now inherent in it, had previously been added artificially. Thus, cultivation itself increases the diversity of natural fertility between cultivated and wastelands. Anderson says expressly that the land for whose produce average price and market price coincide can pay no rent. Where there are two fields, the produce of which is nearly as above stated, namely the one yielding 12 bushels covering the costs, the other 20, without requiring any immediate outlay for their improvement, the farmer would pay even more rent than 6 bushels, for instance, for the latter while he would pay none for the former. If 12 bushels are just sufficient for the expense of cultivating, no rent whatever can be afforded for cultivated land that yields only 12 bushels. Then he immediately goes on to say, Yet it cannot be expected that if the superior produce has been immediately occasioned by his own outlay of capital and exertions of industry, that he could pay nearly the same proportion of it as rent. But after the land has been for some time in a permanent state of fertility to that degree, Though it even originally derived that fertility from his own industry, he will be content to pay such a proportion of rent as is here stated. Supposing, therefore, the produce of the best cultivated land is 20 bushels per acre. Of this, according to the assumption, 12 bushels pay the expenses, that is advances plus average profit. Then it can pay 8 bushels as rent. Assume that the bushel is 5 shillings. Then 8 bushels or 1 quarter are 40 shillings, or 2 pounds, and 20 bushels are 5 pounds, being 2 and a half quarters. Of these five pounds, 12 bushels, or 60 shillings, which is three pounds, is expenses. Then it pays a rent of two pounds, or eight bushels. If the rate of profit is 
Then of the three pounds of expenses, the outlay is 54 and 611 shillings, and the profit is 5 and 511 shillings. That is, as 110. Now supposing that the farmer had to carry out various improvements on wasteland, which is just as fertile as that yielding 20 bushels had been originally, in order to bring it into such a state of cultivation that would correspond to the general state of agriculture, apart from the outlay of 54 and 611 shillings, or if we reckon the profit in with the expenses, apart from the 60 shillings, this may involve a further outlay of 36 and 4 elevenths. Then 10% on this would be 3 and 7 elevenths. And if the farmer always sold 20 bushels at 5 shillings, he could pay a rent only after 10 years, only after the reproduction of his capital. From then on, the artificially created fertility of the land would be reckoned as original and would fall to the landlord. Although the newly cultivated land is as fertile as the best cultivated land was originally, the market price and the average price for its product do nevertheless coincide now because it contains an item of costs which is extinct in the best land, whose artificially created fertility and whose natural fertility coincide to a certain extent. But with the newly cultivated land, that part of fertility which is created artificially by the application of capital is still entirely distinct from the natural fertility of the land. The newly cultivated land can therefore pay no rent, although its original fertility may be the same as that of the best cultivated land. After 10 years, however, it could pay not only rent, but as much rent as the best type which was cultivated earlier. Thus, Anderson comprehends both phenomena. One, that the differential rent of the landlords is partly the result of the fertility which the farmer has given the land artificially, and two, that after a certain lapse of time, this artificial fertility appears as the original productivity of the soil itself, in that the soil itself has been transformed, and the process by which this transformation has been accomplished has disappeared and is no longer visible. If today I build a cotton mill for £100,000, I get a more efficient mill than my predecessor who set one up 10 years ago. I do not pay for the difference between productivity and machine building, or building in general, etc. The difference between today and 10 years ago. On the contrary, it enables me to pay less for a mill of the same efficiency, or only the same for a mill of higher efficiency. In agriculture, it is different. The difference between the original fertilities of the soils is magnified by that part of the so-called natural fertility of the soil, which, in fact, has been once produced by men, but has now become incorporated in the soil and is no longer to be distinguished from its original fertility. Owing to the development of the productive power of labor in general, it costs less to raise uncultivated soil of the same original fertility to the improved level of fertility than it costs to bring the original fertility of the cultivated soil to the apparently original fertility it now has, but some expenditure is still required to bring that equalization about. The average price of the new product is consequently higher than that of the old. The difference between market price and average price is thus smaller and may disappear completely. But supposing, in the above case, the newly cultivated soil is so fertile that after the additional expense of 40 shillings, including profit, it yields 28 bushels instead of 20. In this case, the farmer could pay a rent of 8 bushels, or 2 pounds. And why? Because the newly cultivated soil yields 8 bushels more than the old, so that despite the higher average price, with the same market price, it yields just as much in excess of the price. If it had involved no extra expense, its fertility would be double that of the old land. With this expense, it is the same as that of the old land. Section 10. The untenability of the Rodbertian critique of Ricardo's theory of rent. Rodbertus's lack of understanding of the peculiarities of capitalist agriculture. Now back to Rodbertus, definitively and for the last time. Quote, Rodbertus's theory of rent explains all phenomena of wages and rent, etc., by a division of the labor product, which necessarily occurs if two prerequisites, adequate productivity of labor and property in land and capital, are given. It explains that the adequate productivity of labor alone constitutes the economic possibility of such a division, and that this productivity gives to the value of the product so much actual content that, in addition, other people who do not work can also live from it. And it explains that landed property and capital property alone constitute the legal reality of such a division, and that it forces the workers to share their product with the non-working proprietors of land and capital, and what is more, in such a proportion that they, the workers, only get so much of it as to enable them to live. Adam Smith sets forth this problem in two ways. The first concept, the division of the product of labor, where this is regarded as given, and he is in fact concerned with the distribution of use value. 
This is also Rodbertus's conception. It is also to be found with Ricardo, who is all the more to be reproached on this account, because he does not merely confine himself to general phrases, but seriously tries to determine the value by labor time. This conception is more or less mutatis mutandis applicable to all modes of production where the workers and the owners of the objective conditions of labor form different classes. Smith's second conception, on the other hand, is characteristic of the capitalist mode of production. Hence, it alone is a theoretically fruitful formula, for Smith here conceives of profit and rent as springing from the surplus labor which the worker adds to the subject of labor, apart from that portion of labor by which he only reproduces his own wage. This is the only correct standpoint where production rests solely on exchange value. This concept comprises the process of development, whereas the first concept presupposes that labor time is constant. With Ricardo, the one-sidedness arises also from the fact that in general, he wants to show that the various economic categories or relationships do not contradict the theory of value, instead of, on the contrary, developing them together with their apparent contradictions out of this basis, or presenting the development of this basis itself. You know that all economists, already from Adam Smith onwards, split up the value of the product into wages, ground rent, and capital gain, and that therefore the idea of basing the incomes of the different classes, and particularly also rent, on a division of the product is nothing new. Certainly not. Only the economists immediately go astray. All of them, not even accepting the Ricardian school, first of all commit the error of not regarding the whole product, the entire wealth, the total national product as the unit in which the workers, the landowners, and the capitalists participate. On the contrary, they regard the division of the raw product as a particular division in which three participants share, and the division of the manufactured product again as a particular division in which only two participants share. So these systems consider that the mere raw product and the mere manufactured product, each in itself, is a special kind of wealth which constitutes income. First of all, by breaking down the whole value of the product into wages, ground rent, and capital gain, and thus forgetting about constant capital, which also forms a part of value, Adam Smith has, in fact, led astray all the later economists, including Ricardo and including Rodbertus. As my exposition has shown, the lack of this differentiation made any scientific presentation quite impossible. In this respect, the physiocrats were further advanced. Their original advances and annual advances are defined as a part of the value of the annual product, or as a part of the annual product itself, which is not resolved into wages, profit, or rent, either for the nation or for the individual. According to the physiocrats, the raw material of the agriculturalists replaces the advances of the sterile class. The transformation of this raw material into machines, of course, devolves on the sterile class. While on the other hand, the agriculturalists replace a part of their own advances, seeds, cattle for breeding and draft animals, fertilizer, etc., from their product and get a part, that is machinery, replaced by the sterile class in exchange for raw material. Secondly, Rodbertus errs in that he identifies division of value with division of product. The quote-unquote wealth which constitutes income has nothing directly to do with this division of value of the product. That the portions of value which accrue, for instance, to the producers of yarn, and which are represented in certain quantities of gold, exist as agricultural and manufactured products of all kinds, is equally well known to the economists as to Rodbertus. This is taken for granted because commodities are produced, and not products for the immediate consumption of the producers themselves. Since the value which becomes available for distribution, i.e. the part of the value which forms revenue, is created within each individual sphere of production, independently of the others, although on account of the division of labor it presupposes the others, Rodbertus takes a step backward and creates confusion by not examining this creation of value on its own, but confusing it right from the start by asking what share of the available total product of the nation these component parts secure for their owners. With Rodbertus, division of the value of the product immediately becomes division of use values. Because he foists this confusion upon the other economists, there arises the need for his corrective, i.e. the consideration of manufactured and raw products altogether, a mode of procedure which is irrelevant to the creation of value, and hence wrong if it is to explain the latter. The only participants in the value of the manufactured product, insofar as it comprises revenue, and insofar as the manufacturer does not pay a rent, be it for land on which the buildings stand or for waterfalls, etc., the only participants are the capitalist and the wage laborer. The value of the agricultural produce is generally divided between three. This, Rudbertus also admits, 
The manner in which he explains this phenomenon does not in any way alter this fact. It is entirely in accord with the standpoint of capitalist production that the other economists, especially Ricardo, start from a division into two between capitalist and wage labor and only bring in the landowner who draws rent at a later stage as a special excrescence. Capitalist production is based on the antithesis of two factors, materialized labor and living labor. Capitalist and wage laborer are the sole functionaries and factors of production, whose relationship and confrontation arise from the nature of the capitalist mode of production. The circumstances under which the capitalist has in turn to share a part of the surplus labor or surplus value which he has captured with a third, non-working person are only of secondary importance. It is also a fact of production that after the part of the value which is equal to constant capital is deducted, the entire surplus value passes straight from the hands of the worker to those of the capitalist, with the exception of that part of the value of the product which is paid out as wages. The capitalist confronts the worker as the direct owner of the entire surplus value, in whatever manner he may later be sharing it with the money-lending capitalist, the landowner, etc. As James Mill observes, production could therefore continue undisturbed if the landed proprietor disappeared and the state took his place. He, the private landowner, is not a necessary agent for capitalist production, although it does require that the land should belong to someone, so long as it is not the worker, but for instance the state. Far from being an error on the part of Ricardo, etc., this reduction of the classes participating directly in production, hence also in the value produced, and then in the products in which this value is embodied, to capitalists and wage laborers, and the exclusion of the landowners, who only enter post festum as a result of conditions of ownership of natural forces that have not grown out of the capitalist mode of production, but have been passed on to it, is rooted in the nature of the capitalist mode of production, as distinct from the feudal or ancient, etc. This reduction is an adequate theoretical expression of the capitalist mode of production, and reveals its defining characteristics. Rodbertus is still too much of an old Prussian landed proprietor to understand this. Furthermore, it can only be grasped and become self-evident when the capitalist has seized agriculture, and everywhere, as is generally the case in England, has taken charge of agriculture just as he has of industry, and has excluded the landowner from any direct participation in the production process. What Rodbertus regards as a deviation is, therefore, the right path, which, however, he does not understand, because he is still engrossed in views that originated from the pre-capitalist mode of production. Quote, Ricardo, too, does not divide the finished product among the parties concerned, but like other economists, regards the agricultural product as well as the manufactured product as a separate product which has to be divided. Not the product, Rodbertus, but the value of the product, and this is quite correct. Your finished product and its division have absolutely nothing to do with this division of value. Ricardo regards capital property as given, and that even earlier than landed property. Thus he does not begin with the reasons for, but with the fact of, the division of the product, and his entire theory is limited to the causes which determine and modify the proportions of the shares. The division of the product purely into wages and capital gain is for him the original one, and originally also the only one. This you fail to understand again, Rodbertus. From the standpoint of capitalist production, capital property does in fact appear as the original because capitalist production is based on this sort of property, and it is a factor of and fulfills a function in capitalist production. This does not hold good of landed property. The latter appears as derivative because modern landed property is in fact feudal property, but transformed by the action of capital upon it. In its form as modern landed property, it is therefore derived from, and the result of, capitalist production. That Ricardo considers the position as it is and appears in modern society to be also the historically original situation, whereas you, instead of keeping to the modern form, cannot rid yourself of your memories of land ownership, is a delusion from which the bourgeois economists suffer in respect of all bourgeois economic laws. They appear to them as natural laws, and hence also as historically primary. But Rodbertus could already see from the very first sentence of his preface that Ricardo, where it is not a question of the value of the product, but of the product itself, permits the whole of the finished product to be shared out. The produce of the earth, all that is derived from its surface by the united application of labor, machinery, and capital, is divided among three classes of the community, namely the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock, or capital, necessary for its cultivation, and the laborers by whose industry it is cultivated.
but in different stages of society. The proportions of the whole produce of the earth, which will be allotted to each of these classes, under the names of rent, profit, and wages, will be essentially different. He is concerned here with the distribution of the whole produce, not the manufactured product or the raw product. If this whole produce is taken as given, these shares in the whole produce are solely determined within each sphere of production by the share which each shareholder has in the value of his own product. This value is convertible into and can be expressed in a certain proportional part of the whole produce. Ricardo only errs here, following Adam Smith, in that he forgets that the whole produce is not divided into rent, profit, and wages, but that part of it will be allotted in the shape of capital to one or some of these three classes. You might want to assert that just as originally the law of equal capital gains would have had to depress raw product prices so far that ground rent would have to disappear only to be recreated as a result of rise in prices due to the difference between the yield of more fertile and less fertile land, so today the advantages of drawing rent besides the usual capital gain would induce the capitalist to spend capital on few cultivations and improvements until, due to the flooding of markets brought forth by this, prices would fall suddenly in order to make rents on the least favorable capital investments disappear again. In other words, this would be to assert that so far as the raw product is concerned, the law of the equalization of capital gains invalidates the other law, that the value of the products is governed by labor costs, while it is just Ricardo who, in the first chapter of his work, uses the former to prove the latter. Indeed, Rodbertus, the law of the equalization of capital gains does not invalidate the law that the value of the products is governed by labor costs, but it does invalidate Ricardo's assumption that the average price of the products equals their value. But there again, it is not the raw product whose value is reduced to the average price, but the other way around. Due to landed property, the raw product is distinguished by the privilege that its value is not reduced to the average price. If indeed its value did decrease, which would be possible despite your value of the material, to the level of the average price of the commodities, then rent would disappear. The types of land which possibly pay no rent today pay none because the market price of raw products is for them equal to their own average price, and because the competition of more fertile types of land deprives them of the privilege of selling their product at its value. Could it be true that before any cultivation takes place at all, capitalists already exist who receive a profit and invest their capital according to the law of profit equalization? How very silly. I admit that if today an expedition from the civilized countries set out to a new uncultivated land, an expedition in which the wealthier participants were equipped with supplies and tools, capital, from an old established culture, and the poorer ones came along with a view to winning a high wage in the service of the former, then the capitalists would regard as their gain that which remains to them over and above the wages of the workers, for they bring with them from their mother country things and ideas which have long been in existence there. Well, there you have it, Rodbertus. Ricardo's whole conception is only appropriate to the presupposition that the capitalist mode of production is the predominant one. How he expresses this presupposition, whether he commits a historical inversion of the order, is irrelevant to the theory. The presupposition must be made, and it is therefore impossible to introduce, as you are doing, the peasant who does not understand capitalist bookkeeping and hence does not reckon seeds etc. as part of the capital advanced. The absurdity is introduced not by Ricardo, but by Rodbertus, who assumes that capitalists and workers exist before cultivation of the land. According to the Ricardian concept, cultivation of the land is supposed to begin only when capital has been created in a society and capital gain is known and paid. What utter nonsense! Only when a capitalist has squeezed himself as farmer between the husbandman and the landed proprietor be it that the old tenant has swindled his way into becoming a capitalist farmer, or that an industrialist has invested his capital in agriculture rather than in manufacture, only then begins, by no means the cultivation of the land, but capitalist land cultivation, which is very different, both in form and content, from the previous forms of cultivation. In every country, the greater part of the land is already owned by someone long before it's cultivated, and certainly long before a rate of capital profit has been established in industry. To comprehend Ricardo's conception, Rodbertus would have to be an Englishman instead of a Pomeranian landowner, and would have to understand the history of the enclosure of commons and wasteland. Rodbertus cites America. There, the state sells the land, quote, in lots, first to the cultivators at a low price, it is true, but one which must, at all events, already represent a rent. By no means. This price does not constitute a ground rent, any more than, say, a general trade tax constitutes a trade rent, 
or in fact any tax constitutes a rent. With regard to the cause of the rise under point B, that is the increase in population or the increase in the quantity of labor employed, I maintain, however, that rent has precedence over capital gain. The latter can never rise because, as a result of the increased value of the national product, if productivity remains the same but productive power increases, that is, increased population, more capital gain accrues to the nation. For this greater capital gain always accrues to a capital which is greater in the same proportion, the rate of profit therefore remains the same. This is wrong. The quantity of unpaid surplus labor rises, for instance, if three, four, five hours of surplus labor time are worked instead of two hours. The volume of capital advanced does not grow to the same extent as the volume of this unpaid surplus labor, firstly because this further excess of surplus labor is not paid for and so does not occasion a capital outlay, secondly because the capital outlay for fixed capital does not grow in the same proportion as its utilization in this instance. No more spindles, etc. are required. True, they are used up more quickly, but not in the same proportion in which their use increases. Thus, given the same productivity, profit grows here, because not only the surplus value grows, but also the rate of surplus value. In agriculture, this is impracticable because of the natural conditions. On the other hand, productivity is easily altered with the increased outlay of capital. Although an absolutely large amount of capital is laid out, it is relatively not so big due to economies in the conditions of production, quite apart from the division of labor and machinery. Thus, the rate of profit could grow, even if the surplus value, not only its rate, remain the same. Rodbertus is positively wrong, and typically the Pomeranian landowner, when he says, quote, It is possible that in the course of these 30 years, from 1800 to 1830, more properties came into being through the parceling out of land, or even through the cultivation of new land, and the increased rent was also thus divided among more landowners, but it was not distributed over more acres in 1830 than in 1800. Previously, the older properties comprised the whole of the acreage of those newly separated or newly cultivated properties, and the lower rent of 1800 was also calculated on them, and this influenced the level of English rent in general at that time just as much as the higher rent in 1830. <laughs> Worthy Pomeranian, why do you always transfer your Prussian situation to England in a disparaging manner? The Englishman does not reckon that if, as was the case, three to four million acres were enclosed between 1800 and 1830, the rent on these four million acres was calculated before 1830 as well and also in 1800. Rather, they were wasteland or commons which bore no rent and did not belong to anybody. It has nothing to do with Ricardo if Rodbertus, like Carey but in a different way, seeks to prove to Ricardo that for physical and other reasons, the most fertile land is usually not the first to be cultivated. The most fertile land is always the most fertile under the existing conditions of production. A very large number of the objections which Robertus raises against Ricardo arise from the naive manner in which he identifies the Pomeranian conditions of production with the English. Ricardo presupposes capitalist production, to which, where it is in fact carried out, as in England, corresponds the separation of the farming capitalist from the landlord. Rodbertus introduces circumstances which are in themselves alien to the capitalist mode of production, which has merely been built upon them. For instance, what Rodbertus says about the position of economic centers and economic complexes applies perfectly to Pomerania, but not to England, where the capitalist mode of production has become increasingly preeminent since the last third of the 16th century where it has assimilated all the conditions and in different periods has progressively sent historical preconditions, villages, buildings, and people, to the devil in order to secure the most productive investment for capital. What Rodbertus says about capital investment is equally wrong. Ricardo limits ground rent to that which the landowner is paid for the use of the original, natural, and indestructible qualities of the land. He thus wants to ensure that everything which would have to be ascribed to capital in the land which is already being cultivated is deducted from rent. But it is clear that out of the yield from a piece of land, he must never allot more to capital than the full interest customary in a country, for otherwise he would have to assume that there are two different rates of gain in the economic development of a country, one agricultural, which is greater than that prevailing in manufacture, and this latter. This assumption would overthrow his very system, which is based on the equality of the rate of gain. Again, the notion of the Pomeranian landowner who gets money on tick in order to prove his property and who, for theoretical and practical reasons, only wants to pay the moneylender the customary interest. But in England, things are different, 
It is the farmer, the farming capitalist, who lays out capital in order to improve the land. From this capital, just as from that which he lays out directly in production, he does not demand the customary interest, but the customary profit. He does not tend the landowner any capital on which the latter is to pay the customary interest. He may borrow capital himself, or else he uses his own surplus capital so that it yields him the customary industrial profit, at least double the customary interest. Incidentally, Ricardo knows what Anderson already knew, and into the bargain expressly says that the productivity of the land thus engendered by capital later coincides with its natural productivity, hence swells the rent. Rodbertus knows nothing of all this and therefore babbles away at random. I have already given a correct explanation of modern landed property. Quote, Rent, in the Ricardian sense, is the property in land in its bourgeois state, that is, feudal property which has become subject to the conditions of bourgeois production. End quote from the Poverty of Philosophy. Similarly, I have already observed, quote, Ricardo, after postulating bourgeois production as necessary for determining rent, applies the conception of rent, nevertheless, to the landed property of all ages in all countries. This is an error common to all the economists who represent the bourgeois relations of production as eternal categories. End quote. I also pointed out correctly that land as capital could be increased like all other capitals. Quote, land as capital can be increased just as much as all the other instruments of production. Nothing is added to its matter, to use Monsieur Proudhon's language, but the lands which serve as instruments of production are multiplied. The very fact of applying further outlays of capital to land already transformed into means of production increases land as capital without adding anything to land as matter, that is, to the extent of the land, end quote. The difference between manufacture and agriculture, which I pointed out at that time, still remains correct. Quote, in the first place, one cannot, as in manufacturing industry, multiply at will the instruments of production possessing the same degree of productivity, that is, plots of land with the same degree of fertility. Then, as population increases, land of an inferior quality begins to be exploited, or new outlays of capital, proportionately less productive than before, are made upon the same plot of land, end quote. Rodbertus says, quote, But I must draw attention to yet another circumstance, which admittedly, much more gradually, but also far more generally, turns worse agricultural machines into better ones. This is the continued management of a piece of land merely in accordance with a rational system, without making any special capital investment. You would have to prove that the working population engaged in agriculture had, in the course of time, increased to a greater degree than the production of food, or even just compared with the rest of the population of a country. Only this could irrefutably show that increasing agricultural production also demands that progressively more labor is expended upon it. But it is just here that statistics contradict you. Indeed, you will find that pretty well as a rule, the denser population of a country, the smaller will be the proportion of people engaged in agriculture. The same phenomenon can be observed when the population of a country increases. That section which is not engaged in agriculture will almost everywhere increase to a greater degree. But this is partly because more arable land is turned over to cattle and sheep grazing, partly because with the higher stage of production, that is large-scale agriculture, labor becomes more productive. But also, and this is a circumstance which Rodbertus overlooks entirely, because a greater part of the non-agricultural population assist in agriculture, supplying constant capital, which grows with the advance in cultivation, such as mineral fertilizers, seeds from other countries, machinery of every sort. At present, the agriculturalist, in Pomerania, does not regard the feeding stuffs for his draft animals as capital if he has grown these in his own establishment. Capital in itself, or from an economic point of view, is a product which continues to be used for production, but in respect of a particular gain which it is to yield, or from the point of view of today's entrepreneurs, it must appear as an outlay in order to be capital. This concept of outlay, however, does not, as Rodbertus thinks, require that it is bought as a commodity. If, instead of being sold as a commodity, a part of the product re-enters production, it does so as a commodity. It has previously been estimated as money. This is easily done, since simultaneously all these outlays in agriculture too are available on the market as commodities. Cattle, feeding stuffs, fertilizers, corn for sowing, seeds of all kinds. But it seems that in Pomerania, this is not reckoned as outlay. The value of the particular results of these different sorts of work, that is manufacture and primary production, is not the income itself which accrues to their owner, but only the measure for its conversion into money. This particular income itself is a part of the social income, which is only produced by the combined labor in agriculture and manufacture, 
and its elements too are thus only produced by this combined effort. This is quite irrelevant. The realization of this value can only be its realization in use value, but we are not concerned with that. Furthermore, the necessary wage already implies how much value in the shape of agricultural or industrial products is contained in the means of subsistence the worker requires.